Greetings and welcome to In the Trees, the cannabis gardening and lifestyle podcast. Highlighting methods, products, growers, and breeders from Maine, the East Coast, and beyond. I'm your host, Mr. Roots, and I'm stoked to deliver you the lowdown on all things cannabis, presented not just for the well-vetted OGs in the garden, but for those buying a seed pack to grow their very first garden. This show is especially for those buying their very first cannabis to try. If you are listening in your car, sit back, relax, and strap on your seatbelt. And if you are listening in the garden, turn us up so you can hear us over the fans. Sending out good vibes from the rock-bound coast of Maine, we are in the trees. Here we are, In the Trees podcast, bringing you a four-alarm fire of an episode. So I want to say, welcome and thank you all for listening. The team has been so pumped on this one, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to share this project with you. If this is your first time checking out the podcast, we're glad you've joined us for these sessions we produce on cannabis advice, reviews, stories, and knowledge. Some great guests have come through and recorded with us, so I hope you'll have a look through our past episodes and give them a listen as well. In particular, I would recommend that you listen to the episode before this one, our special feature titled, How to Choose Quality Flower, as it's something of a companion to the one you're about to hear, with advice on how to choose quality flower from several high-grade cannabis connoisseurs, including Frenchy Cannoli's perspective on how he selects flower to smoke. Before we get into this episode, I want to give you a quick bit of history about why we at In the Trees wanted to do this episode and the one before it. For starters, most of the interviews with today's guests were recorded about a month before adult use went into effect here in Maine. A big changeup was on deck, and the gears in my head were turning towards ways that In the Trees could deliver proper information to the cannabis community here in Maine and beyond. We always want to help better inform people concerning ways they can suss out what's really worth buying and using in the cannabis market. And you don't need to take my word for it. We like to bring you perspectives from top-ranking producers in today's cannabis field. So, with this episode, and the one before it, I reached out to some folks whose opinions on these topics are very well respected in the cannabis community. I posed a question that was purposely kept very general. In order to spark up further discussion and clarification from our guests, I asked each of them to weigh in on how to choose quality hash from a consumer's perspective. All right, this is a nice long episode jam-packed with a ton of crucial information. So let's jump right into it. This episode's guests are Reed from Hiker Trash Cannabis Company. When I wash hash and it's really good and it turns out well, it's all credit to the grower. Mega Raw Melts. It's, it's really just like with the flower, man, it really comes down so much to personal preference. Andy of Great Lakes Grease. The first thing that I would look for is to know where it came from. Murphy Murray. You know, I think one thing we've all agreed upon is that cannabis treats everybody differently. And Frenchy Cannoli. What is inside that resin is pretty damn important too. Each delivering some very high knowledge for you. Go to that secret spot and take out that special head stash hash. Then get that ceremonial pipe or rig out. Because In the Trees podcast and today's guests are bringing that fire. In the Trees podcast is proudly sponsored by the Maine Craft Cannabis Association. The MCCA is a diverse group of businesses and activists committed to supporting an authentic craft cannabis industry in Maine. Their motto, 
people, place, and plant represents their focus on fighting for craft main grown businesses through their legislative work in Augusta. The MCCA's social activism supports all Mainers' legal protected access to the plant. Check them out on Facebook and Instagram by searching for Maine Craft Cannabis Association and please show your support to this extremely valuable organization. Starting us off is Maine-based hash connoisseur, 2015 Appalachian Trail northbound through hiker, and one half of the brand that's been making a solid name for itself on the storefront shelves, Reed of Hiker Trash Cannabis Company. Hmm. It really boils down to trusting the source would be kind of the short and sweet of it. And knowing the grower, the processor, even the breeder, I mean, it, they all play in line. Like when I watch Ash and it's really good and it turns out well, it's all credit to the grower. It makes my job easy and it really lets clean, proper medicine shine through. And so I think if you find a grower that you really like, it's going to take some trial and error and then they have some concentrator rosin or whatever it is available, then check them out first and just kind of go with who you trust. And there's always going to be trial and error, but I think going with your personal favorite is always the best place to start. If your go-to is Humble Family, for instance, and then you are, are looking at at the rosin selection and you see some humble family, then that would be my go-to for a first try. Something you're familiar with and you trust the source, you trust the grower, you know it's good, clean medicine. And then that is what's going to translate over into the hash is that good, clean medicine. So if you can't find your favorite grower, then maybe look for your favorite strain or something that you're familiar with just to, to have kind of one leg in the door at least when you're searching for that, that first concentrate purchase. Yeah, I think that's a good first step when you're buying your first gram of hash because it's gonna be you know one of the more expensive things on that shelf. I've been there, I know that first hash rosin or old school hash purchase and, and it's, it's a big one. It's something that's gonna stay in your box for a long period of time. And so you really want it to be worth it. And I've had several times where it's just not worth it. When you go out on a limb, you try something new, a new company you've never heard of, and it just doesn't turn out to be what you thought it was. So a good way to avoid that would just be to find either a brand that you're already familiar with or play that trial and error game until you find something that you like, something that you can go off of and take that and run with it. Next up is a hash maker who's been honing his craft for years and whose melts are certainly among the most sought after here in Maine, for very good reason. Lit off that notorious pie dough hash rosin, here is the man, Mega Raw Melts. So with consumers in mind, how is it that you determine quality hash, Mega? I guess I would go into the store and just you know, kind of asked to see what's there. You know, I would just go by smell probably the best. And I mean, look, just kind of depends what you're looking for. If you're looking for like a gassy strain or you're looking for a fruity strain, um, you know, yeah, it's important to ask questions, I guess, to the bud tender and see if they can give you any more background information. But, um, you know, I think it's, it's really just like with the flower, man, it really comes down so much to personal preference, you know, what might be one person's cup of tea and their favorite and like the new best thing they've ever tried might kind of just be like, not the favorite of someone else. So that's right. one thing I've found is like a lot of, you know, the kind of more big name stuff that's kind of come from California recently, um, like the purple punch and the wedding cake. And I mean, I think don't get me wrong. I think both of those strains are great, maybe in crosses with other stuff. And I think they have a lot of potential. To me, neither of them were really something that I would per se seek out for my personal use, just because neither of the examples that I've seen available to me on the market have been stuff that I've really personally enjoyed or, or see, you know, been seeking out. I think the wedding cake 
I mean, it's an incredible strain, has a lot of potential. Obviously, the flower is, uh, you know, speaks for itself. And I think Purple Punch is really fast flowering, has really great bag appeal. Same thing, you know, the flower kind of speaks for itself. But in terms of the concentrates, those are two examples for me that haven't really ticked the boxes that I look for, I guess, for my own personal thing, which is so much my personal preference for flavor. And also, you know, everything's going to get you a different degree of stoned or high. So yeah, I think a lot of stuff kind of just doesn't really hit super hard. So I also now, I mean, yeah, flavor is obviously something I'm looking for, but also, yeah, potency is a, is a big thing, you know, and I think I'm definitely trying to seek out those ones that really hit as a concentrate. Yeah, definitely. It is very subjective to the user. And I feel like a lot of times when people are going into a storefront to try to pick up, a, let's say a gram of hash rosin, price tags, you know, usually pretty steep on a, on a quality gram of hash rosin. And then they may have a little bit of difficulty sussing out what it is exactly that they're looking for without doing a fair amount of research into what's the strain, who did the wash, who is the grower, and then maybe trying to get a nose to the jar. You know, I think all that definitely great ways to uh, to go about it. And yeah, it's obviously you got to be discerning with the, with the price points being pretty high for this stuff. I guess from a processing standpoint, some good information for the consumer is, I mean, in some cases, you know, we have stuff, stuff that washes back at like one or 2%, you know, that's really not a good viable washer. And in those cases that I've had things that have done that, you know, can't go out there and sell it for two or three times the price of right. the market rate for uh, what R- Rosin is selling for. So in some cases, yeah, you kind of have to take the wins and the losses with this kind of solventless processing. But yeah, as it's evolved, you know, much more people have kind of identified and done breeding to try to isolate more solventless processing in mind. Frass Valley is an organic, superworm-based garden amendment that I personally have used a bunch in my garden. It has a balanced NPK ratio and a lab-tested level of ketin at 16.9%. This means that it aids your plant in building its immune system, increasing beneficial microorganisms and mycorrhiza in your soil, while also discouraging soil-borne insects who might be looking to prey on your garden. If you are looking for an amendment that will help you grow strong plants, check them out at Frass Valley on Instagram or go to their website, frassvalley.com, to order some today. Listeners of the show receive 10% off their orders by using the code words in the trees at checkout. Wait till you see what Frass Valley's Superworm Frass can do for your garden. Well, as far as buying it from a store, the first thing that I would look for is I would look for it to be sourced and to know where it came from and how it was grown as well, because it's very important that it was grown naturally and organically because you're going to be consuming it and you want to know where it came from. The other, the other thing I would look for is how they're storing it in the store. Are they storing it on the shelf at room temperature or do they have a hash refrigerator or cooler or something like that where they are keeping it cold and preserving it better um, while it, while it is on the shelf? Also, I would definitely recommend that a lot of shops kind of have a sample jar to where it is out at room temperature to where they can open it. And when a patient comes in or a consumer comes in, to get their products, they can actually see it, open it, smell it. It's very important because everyone's different. It's very important that you are able to smell the terpenes and you are able to to look at the product because one terpene profile for someone might be completely different. You know, their preference might be completely different as for someone else. So it's very important when you do smell it and when you do see it, that it kind of moves you. It kind of, you know, you feel the energy from it and, and, and that's what you want. And then maybe you can 
take some of that home, but you know, buy a small amount of it, take some of it home, try it out. And then if you really like that, you can go back and get more. Another thing that I would look for as far as hash rosin goes, the consistency of it, I tend to, I tend to stay away from things that are too dry looking because it usually kind of seems like they've been stored for longer periods of time. Not, not always, but usually I look for a more like saucy type rosin and that's kind of like the consistency that, that I personally go for uh, when making hash rosin. Greasy rosin then. Yeah. Oh, most definitely. (laughs) (laughs) You were saying that you look for a a granular hash, a more of like exclusively resin heads as well. Is this correct? Yeah. That's kind of the primary thing that I make is air dried ice hash. And if I was looking for that in a store, it would most definitely need to be stored in a refrigerator. What I look for in that is stability. You want it to be stable because if it's not stable, it could have moisture in it. So as far as having a sample out, I feel like that's pretty important for a shop to have a small sample fresh out of the freezer every day or every few days for the consumer to see. Because if it's if it's sitting out at room temp, it's obviously going to grease up. And that's the consistency that I love and a lot of people love and, and a lot of people look for is that oil, that hash that's just melted down into an oil on its own without being tampered with, without being messed with full melt yeah oh yeah and a a big part of that for me is that like when that happens i like it to be stay in a stable form rather than caking up or waxing up because a lot of times not always but a lot of times that means there could be moisture in in the hash i have seen that some just some terpene profiles do kind of cake up like that but not within a couple days so that's a big thing that, that I would be looking for is that, I mean, I think that sample jar is very important so people can really look at their product and, you know, what they're, what they're going to be buying. And, you know, you definitely don't want to take it right out of the freezer or the fridge into room temperature and then open the jar right up because of condensation and things like that. You want to let it gradually go down to room temp. And so that's kind of what I was saying about the, the sample jar is, is you'd already have that at room temp when the consumer comes in and they can visually see, smell the product. I've seen and heard a lot of discussion about people harvesting early to try to get that lighter color. To me, that equates to the sense of sight and yes. almost equals that bag appeal that people yes. look for as well. Most flower. definitely. My experience with that is I've, I've never harvested plants prematurely to get lighter resin. Because like I said, I'm, I'm looking for more so the effects and the, the true effects of the plant. And not only that, but like I want to see the plant express itself and the resin express itself. And you don't really get to see that if you harvest it prematurely. I've had strains where I've grown them longer, you know, I've taken them longer than other years and they really have like brought out extremely unique notes that I've never, I've never experienced in those strains before and as well as effects. And for me, that's like, really important. And so while, while bag appeal, you know, is important, especially from a consumer standpoint, um, I wouldn't necessarily like only look for a light colored hash. And honestly, if, if you're looking at a, a nice water hash in the, in the store and it's, it's like purely white, like very light colored, I wouldn't necessarily stay away from it, but I, I would say that it, it might be, you know, a little premature, still probably worth trying. But just my experience in dabbing other people's products that does look like that, I don't really get much of an effect from it comparatively. You know what I'm saying? Just it's very mild and mellow. And with that being said, though, some people may be looking for that kind of thing. That was one of Michigan's own right there, Andy, or better known on Instagram as Great Lakes Grease, who, along with providing sage advice to consumers about quality hash, also delivers some crucial information for storefronts to consider concerning the storage and presentation of hash at market.
Here comes Murphy Murray. With so many amazing perspectives, they certainly could have been their own standalone episode. Honestly, I want to mention that I knew Murphy was an extremely well-regarded cannabis educator and consultant, that she was smart and well-spoken, but for real, I was absolutely blown away by how progressive and well-constructed her reasonings were during this interview. Enjoy! In the Trees podcast is absolutely stoked to be joined this evening with Murphy Murray. Happy to be here. Thanks for joining us to talk about extractions and in particular hash. Murphy, I'm, I'm wondering if you could weigh in on how you would inform a consumer about what to look for when trying to select quality hash. Well, I would start by asking a bunch of questions. You know, I think one thing we've all agreed upon is that cannabis treats everybody differently. And so in order to achieve your goals, we have to figure out what your goals are. And, you know, those things are very different from, you know, a medical patient who's consuming 10, 15 different times a day versus a recreational consumer who doesn't even smoke every day, you know, maybe just has like a heavy usage on Friday type of thing. So, you know, the type of consumer you are and the frequency with which you're consuming, even the equipment you're using to consume really is going to impact that choice first and foremost. Because if you buy something that's really designed to be dabbed and your goal is to put it into food, then, you know, you're going to be spending more money than you should. You might be getting compounds that aren't palatable, you know, and also the opposite is true. If you're trying to dab and you're buying basically isolates, then you're not going to get as complex of an experience as you might otherwise. So figuring out what your actual goals are is really key. And sometimes that can be hard because we have multiple goals. Uh, You know, a recent study demonstrated that most recreational consumers are still using for medical reasons. And so it's easy to, you know, assume that these should just be different people. You know, we want to think about a terminal patient and this like, you know, young, healthy partier. Um, And they're just not, it's just not that simple. A lot of us are doing both. And the products that I would choose for my recreational enjoyment are not the same as the products that I look for to, you know, treat a medical condition. And so, you know, starting there is really key. For, For especially patients in Maine where they're just approaching the possibility of rec, it's going to take a little while to see that unwind and kind of figure out who everyone is. Certainly. Yeah. It can be kind of confusing when you have addressed something as medical for so long and then kind of just, whoops, up. actually now go ahead and use it recreationally. Yep, exactly. And it's, uh, you know, it can be confusing from a regulatory perspective as well. And so we end up seeing these huge discrepancies between what's important to consumers and what's important to business owners. And all of that is usually negated by what's important to politicians, right? So we're all fighting with but against each other in a lot of ways. I think the perfect example of that is that medical products in many states have less strict testing requirements than recreational products, which yeah. is a terrifying concept and just just proof of that disconnect between a politician and a patient because that politician's listening to the business and the business is saying the medicine will be too expensive if you impose these burdens on me. Yeah, it's a backward system that's money right. driven all the way around. Yeah, it, exactly. And even people with good intentions can still only really have good intentions for themselves. It's really hard to be a business owner and not relate to both the struggle of a patient wanting to pay less for quality meds and the struggle of a business wanting to have a lower overhead to deliver those meds. And then the struggle of a politician saying, well, I just don't want to be held responsible for any of this. So, you know, what's my liability card? And it you know, it works against you in a lot of ways. So, you know, normally my first piece of advice to someone who wants a concentrate for medical use is look for testing. And in many states, that's literally not even an option. So if you're in Maine, your medical products have not been required to be tested at all this whole time. And that would be very stressful for me for a medical consumer because the frequency with which they're consuming these products is so much higher that minor contaminants are more important to those medical patients. And the recreational market addresses that because the political uh, you know, infrastructure of things like alcohol 
call for a lot of testing. Um, you know, the political structure of things like pharmaceutical medicines call for a lot of testing. So it's really easy to mirror that for REC. But the medical market has, uh, you know, developed outside of that you know, framework first. And so it can be really hard for patients to, uh, to even know where to begin with that. A lot of the testing is very potency focused, which is the least important information usually. Right, um, right. You know, yeah. I can tell if there's THC in there just by smoking it. Uh, you know, so that's not the one that I need compared right. to something like heavy metals or pesticides or mycotoxins or um, terpenes. Metal, even terpenes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I want to know everything that's in there, and you wouldn't buy a loaf of bread that didn't list ingredients because you're used to expecting that kind of standard conformity from your food products, you know, the only alternative to that is when you go buy bread from the manufacturer directly. If I go to a bakery and I buy your loaf of bread, I'm not going to ask you for what type of flour you use, but right. if you want me to buy it off the shelf, I want to know. And, you know, and that's exactly the type of attitude that I would bring to purchasing cannabis concentrates is that you need to either know your source personally in a way where you can reach out to them and ask questions or you need so much transparency in their manufacturing process on their label on their website that you feel confident in the information that's being given to you This is, there's kind of a big juxtaposition in the cannabis community. You know, there's the farmers, there's the growers, there's people like myself who grow right. organic and have forever. And then there's some thugs, some thug wannabes, and some, you know, people who just largely don't really care about integrity and environmental integrity of a product or the medical, the health-based integrity of a product that's going out there. And that's always been there in the cannabis community. I think this may be a time where we're seeing that more. Absolutely. Well, I mean, money breeds in ethical behavior. You know, it's easier to make the wrong choice for money. And I, that doesn't even necessarily mean that like these business owners are personally greedy. Sometimes you have a financial responsibility to your investors mm -hmm. to make a payment. And if you don't, all of your employees go without jobs. And it's very easy as a business owner to look at your 15, 20 employees and say, they have mortgages, they need right. to buy groceries, their payroll will be missed if I don't sell these pounds that yeah. have mold on them. And so as a patient, you'd be like, that guy's a horrible person. How could he possibly sell us moldy weed? But it it was still maybe not necessarily about their greed. You know, maybe they didn't even get any of that money. It's just the, yeah. the nature of business. And with cannabis, we don't normally factor in that kind of assumed loss. You know, if we're growing corn, we would never expect to harvest every plant of corn. Mm -hmm. You know, like we would never expect that every ear is necessary. And with cannabis... That's the case, you know. Yes. We, we need every nub, you know. Yeah, we're we're the world, you know. So it's a, <laughs> it's a different world, and part of that uh, comes from regulation. If you've only got so much canopy, then yeah. what you know, you got to maximize it. If you've got limited veg, sometimes you got to make choices that are not ideal for the way you would want to harvest. And you know, the same thing is very much true in the world of concentrates. You know, mm -hmm. when when someone's growing cannabis, the the marker has always been yield. So they, you know, you ask a grower, they're going to tell you things like, oh, I get two or three pounds of light. They're not going to tell you, oh, I, I generate 25% resin content on all of my biomass. They're not going to give you the information you care about um, right. because whether you're smoking flour or concentrate, the resin is the only thing that matters. No amount of leaf is good or better or worse, you know, like it's all extra. But growers have always been growing for weight because that's uh -huh. the way you buy it. Hence the and dense buds that we're seeing these days. Exactly. Well, and even the dense buds, those come from um, black market trafficking, right? Like the, you see things like haze go away when you've got to pack yeah. it into a vacuum seal bag and, you know, run it from California to Chicago. You know, like when you think about how fluffy an ounce could be, you know, like you want the densest one you can get if it's already got to yeah. go. And the dense True. buds are less affected by the vacuum sealing as well. So it looks better when you break it out of that package, like all of that is justified by like these really, you know, temporary conditions of needing to, to traffic it the way that we do. For an aesthetics-based market, right? 
Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and even in the aesthetics market, most people would still buy a fluffier bud, but I can't vacuum seal that the way that I can a dense PGR rock, you know? So that decision is still kind of, you know, monetary and, and based on feeding a market that's maybe not the same as what you would experience walking into a dispensary. You know, that's why we didn't see CBD flower for so long because traditionally CBD flowers were ugly Mm -hmm. um, because they were being bred for the resin. They were being bred for the CBD. It was never about the flower, but that's the way the the way that people want to buy it. It is a lot more loose and yeah, bud structure wise, a lot more loose. It actually though has a higher resistance to molds and mildews. Exactly. Because a tight bud is not good for any healthy plant, you know, and, and that's the same of like, your tomatoes. If you have a tomato off of every node, that plant is going to struggle. It's not happy doing that. You know, like everything needs a little bit of space to breathe. And, you know, it's, it's hard to find that type of, you know, care and consideration in the growing process to transfer all the way to the end where it's being sold, because there's so many people in between that consumer. If you knew your source, you would have tried their haze before and said, this gets me so high. I love it. And even though if you just had to look at two different ounces in bags, it would never be the most appealing one. You would know that it was because you tried it, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that's where that like personal relationship comes into play. It creates a level of trust that you'd be willing to buy something that doesn't look like what you're used to, um, doesn't smell like what you're used to. Whereas if I'm just going into a dispensary and it's some hourly employee in front of me that's different every week, I don't trust them. You know, I don't trust the business. You know, that financial transaction is very obvious when you walk into that storefront. So we all sort of put up our guard and say, I trust nothing, you know? For consumers who are trying to select really well done solvent based extracts are there things that you can point to that they should steer away from if they can see smell basically those are the only two senses that they'll have access to in a caregiver storefront or a dispensary are there things that you think that generally they could kind of pick up on to steer away from i mean there's a there's a pretty short but i think fairly well known list of things that we know we 100% do not want in our concentrate And so as a general rule, anything green is not going to be high on that list. Um, As a secondary general rule, I would say that anything that is gimmicky, like if you come into uh, blue, pink, purple concentrate, some of that weird stuff, I would go ahead and and pass on that at least for the first time as well. Yeah. Yeah, And and especially with solvents, um, that's something I can can do to anything. So I could make any product appear purple if I wanted to. And so in that way, it's not a trustworthy factor because it's, you know, it's just my influence on it. It's kind of like putting sprinkles on any donut. Like sprinkles are good, but if the donut is not also good, then those sprinkles meant nothing to me. So, you know, you want to kind of avoid trusting color as much as possible outside of knowing that like green is bad and um, anything too rainbow oriented is going to definitely be risky as well. You know, from there, uh, other appearance things that you can pay attention to get a little bit trickier because in the realm of solvent extracted products, we have a lot of influence over the physical consistency of the product. So whether it's very hard and dry or whether it's wet and sticky um, or whether it's wet, but not sticky, for example, like there's a lot of different things I can do to impact that texture. And most of them are just aesthetic. Most of them don't have any real impact on the chemical content. It's just, you know, like the difference between a wet batter and a dry batter might be a small amount of terpene content, but really not much else. The difference between, you know, shatter that's very sticky and pull, pulls apart like a goo compared to shatter that breaks like solid glass is usually, uh, you know, fairly, we're talking like third, fourth decimal points, very insignificant changes in your primary active ingredients as far as your cannabinoids and your terpenes go. Those tend to be fairly consistent across multiple textures. However, some of those textures can point to, you know, whether a product is mostly cannabinoids versus mostly terpene content. That's where stickiness is actually really important. Delta 9 is very sticky. And so that's uh, that's hash that's going to be very dense. 
It's going to stick to everything. It's going to stick to the inside of your container. And THCA is a crystalline solid. It is not sticky at all. So THCA between my fingers is dry. I can wipe it off. Delta 9 between my fingers, I've got to go and get the ethanol. You know, that's not coming off. And so in that, uh, you know, in that regard, knowing how much of your product is activated already or not might be very important to you and can have a huge impact on that consistency. So, you know, if I've got something that is very liquid and not very sticky, that could imply really, really high terpene content. And if it does, you'll know because you can smell it. So that one's an easy one to pick out. If it doesn't smell very strong and it's not very sticky, then we know it's not Delta 9 content. And then now we start looking at, is this contaminants? Is this wax? Is this water? Is this, you know, other categories of things? THCA is very dry, usually crystalline. And so, you know, you're going to notice high, you know, high THCA ratios in anything that's diamonds, anything that's sugar. A lot of rosin is going to be mostly THCA as well, because it'll be nice and dry. Whereas that greasy rosin is usually a little bit of Delta 9 in there. And, you know, and so it's, that's just a consistency thing. As a consumer, you know, a lot of times we think we want the THCA, but in order to smoke the THCA, you do have to decarb it in order to consume it. And that results every time in a 12% loss of max. It's like 11.8, but we'll call it 12. And so if I'm going to buy THCA, I'm actually buying 12% less than whatever that weight is in terms of when I finally inhale it. Right. So that cuts into some overhead, nine, overhead. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so a little bit of Delta 9 actually does go further as far as your money is involved because it's already active. Mm-hmm. You know, so, and that these are just kind of aesthetic preferences, but they're the biggest influencers on that physical consistency. If I want something to stay homogenized, I'm going to make sure that it's partially Delta 9. And if I want something that separates in really creative ways, like having diamonds versus uh, liquids or having, you know, like a real sugary consistency, you know, then I want as little Delta 9 as possible. So, you know, the, it's really just a decision about how I want it to look at that yeah. point and not so much about what the consumer is getting because the jar I start with is the same either way, you know? And, and most of the jars all look the same except for the labels. Right. Exactly. So, mm-hmm. So that makes that physical appearance usually just not a, not a quality data point. However, that seems to really drive the market in storefronts, dispensaries. It's all behind the glass anyways, for the most part. Oh, for sure. And it works because you look at the the hamburger on a fast food, you know, menu is not what you get in your bag, but the way that it looks on that menu is how you decide which one you want, you know, like that appearance drives most of our decisions. It's really hard to get away from that. In that regard, like prefer whatever you want. Generally, that appearance does not have a significant impact on the quality of the product. The next time you're on Weed Maps, type in All Kind and give them a follow. All Kind is a medical caregiver storefront in downtown Portland, Maine, specializing in finely crafted infused Belgian chocolate and other tasty cannabis edibles and products. We are proudly supported by Allkind and personally love their high quality products. Check them out at allkind.buzz on Instagram or go to their website, allkind.buzz, to check out their great selection. Listeners of the show receive a 10% discount by mentioning In the Trees podcast to your bud tender at Allkind. Headlining this episode's proceedings is a man who's provided so much knowledge to the cannabis community over the years through his videos, workshops, and global awareness. We are very grateful to have shared some time in conversation with him and hope you'll listen closely and enjoy the knowledge presented to you by the one and only Frenchie Cannoli. To answer your question, American loose tricon gland is not hashish, but it's what you have on the market here. So for me to judge that, you keep it in the fridge because you don't want the resin gland to melt together. Me, I believe that nature wants the resin to melt together. There must be a very good reason behind and I will never work against nature. Okay, so when to judge it, I put I put it in my pocket. 
I put the jar in my pocket, the, my, the, body, uh, the heat of my body is going to melt the resin. I do that five minutes, I take it from my pocket, and I look. So what I look first, like most everybody, is the melt. But the melt represents how much resin is formed inside the resin head. So it's like it's, it's one part of it. But then what is inside that resin is pretty damn important too. Mm -hmm. How much cannabinoid, how much terpene? I don't get that, I need lab tests to give me that. And beyond that, there is the experience. There is the smell. Mm -hmm. How it tests in your mouth when you, uh, when you smoke it. How intense it is. How long does it last? How unique the test is. This is for me, it's quality more than the melt. I rather have a non-melty ash that blow my palate away yeah. than a super melty ash that tastes like fucking A. Right. Because it does happen. So it's like quality is, is not, is so much element together that uh, it's pretty difficult to define and it becomes very personal to a uh, to a certain level. So basically, it's the melt, mm -hmm. flavor, and aroma in a, in a nutshell. But yeah. the way you you experience the aroma and the flavor, it's it's like 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 wine. It's like like eating a good dinner. It's all your senses are in action. You start by smelling, and you finish by adding the taste in your mouth. What else may would count as quality, but that experience that you just had. Right. And there's only oh. so many, there's only so many senses and you just spoke to two of them. Maybe the only other one would be what it looks like. What it looks like, but looks like it's like, if you believe that black is bad, well, my stuff is really, really bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, uh, what, what are your knowledge behind mm -hmm. the, the critique or the judgment you're putting on the, on what you're uh, on what you're looking at. So, if you give me if you give me a white pearl and I keep put it in my pocket, it's not going to be white anymore. When you microplane, I can microplane ebony. If I do it fine enough, it's going to be white. And if it's finer, it disappears. You don't even see it anymore. Mm -hmm. White is meaningless. Is, doesn't mean a color of the resin gland. Doesn't mean anything. It only shows the intensity of the light on the membrane of the gland. That's all it shows. So if you, if you have any genetics that you grow indoor, in a greenhouse, uh, in a shade uh, outdoor or full sun, well, uh, even if you pick at the perfectly right time that you have that full mail, the raising glands are going to be totally different. You're going to go from dark amber to, uh, to whitish. Mm -hmm. uh, is it the colors that tell you that makes the amount of resin that is formed inside the, the gland? I don't think so. No. That's the uh, harvesting time. It's like if you, there is three days window. If you harvest during those three days, uh, the membrane are bursting. If you, if you harvest the same plant two weeks early, uh, there is no resin formed inside the gland. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. That's right. And so, so harvest, harvest time is very important. It's everything. Your farmer, when, right. when you're an ash maker or an extractor, your farmer and his genetic is everything. Yes. So my question was aimed at a large amount of people here in the United States and soon the world that are going to be approaching an adult use slash recreation market. Mm -hmm. And for them to be able to go into a storefront and try to select quality hashish. You can't touch it. You, can, you cannot look at it. Dude. You cannot smell it. It's, it's, I know. You have to trust. That's the yes. problem. You have to trust the brand. Yeah. Or a right. farm or a region where it grows, uh, if you can have, if you have that, it's, it's, shame. it's a shame. Mm -hmm. It's the it's, same with flour in a lot of places. You, they, you, it's a lot of places you can't even smell the flour. At least you can, you can see the flour, at least. 
right. and they give you a way to, to smell it even if it's not great it gives you a little idea you know what I mean yes. uh, ash they don't even tell you uh, they tell you which flower it's coming but they never tell you if it's indoor sun grown uh, who grew it you have no data but the brand you know, it's like there is a lot of trust that come into play yeah and we should get together as a community and develop a standard we are, we are trying. I mean, there is a few. Uh, we need to be able to to grade, even if it was for competition, to be able to uh, to grade Ashish to have a system of uh, of uh, grading that is accepted by everyone, so that we can speak the same language. You know, yeah. what I mean? and have the same the same data to uh, to start with. It's super important. Yes, I in total agreement. Now, the star system is something that's great about hashish. This is something that doesn't exist with flour. Dude, the, the, the star, it's like when I was 17 years old, it, we had the star system in, in producing country. So when you have a star system in producing country and every grade is very different, you can have six stars and it really defines the grade. When you have so much quality, so much level of quality, what that we have today, we have to go way beyond that. It's not just it's good or bad. It's why is it and how much goodness there is in it. You know what I mean? That's yes. uh, the new level. It's like uh, the five, six, grade, yeah, and they, they judge only the melt. The melt is just a part of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a scoring system of 200 points. Uh, the melt is only 50. Only 15? It's huge, but it's only 50. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's, that's you know telling that? right there. Yeah. So I guess to answer the how you would select quality hash, hashish, um, it's, you have a, a very traditional method of selecting quality hashish, and I, I love your method. It's the, it's the old method, you know? It's the, yeah, it's the I method. Touch, yeah, that's the I need to touch, and most people really do not like people putting their finger in their jar. <laughs> it took me a minute to understand because yeah. you want me to check your stuff. I need to, I need to touch. I need to see how much it melts. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like to, to be able to know. I, I put a little bit in the palm of my hand. I put my thumb. I close my hand with no pressure. And I wait like five, ten seconds. When I open, if it's like straight up sticky, that's highest quality. The more pressure, the more heat I have to apply for the, for the, uh, the resin to really fuse and melt together, the lower the grade. So I, 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 I judge quality by touching it. And by doing this, I smell. Mm -hmm. And the tear have to, uh, have to go strong because I'm breaking everything. You know, I'm breaking the gland and everything so that when you do that, you have that the texture feeling, you have the, the aroma uh, experience at the same time. You never really burn or bring a light. I, I always touch. Okay. Because it's, I don't know, I have more, uh, I can be more accurate uh, because I, uh, I use my own sense, not only my eyes. I don't trust my eyes. <laughs> Enough. Right, you can right. you can cheat the eyes. You cannot cheat your palate, your nose, or uh, or the touch. If it burns, it burns. If it's cold, it's cold. You know what I mean. If it's sticky, sticky. Uh, looking at it, you won't know. So it's like I uh, I think we put a lot too much uh, trust be, uh, behind what we see. Like I uh, any belief. If I don't see it, I don't believe it. Dude, I can make you see stuff that you would believe you should have. <laughs> yeah, right. There's a lot of there's a lot of magicians out there. They yeah. Can make, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. There is so much great information in this episode, and it's presented so well by our guests. I would encourage all of you to keep this episode and the information you heard in mind the next time you go to your favorite storefront or dispensary to buy some hash. It's never been easier to take a look at who is growing the flour that goes into it or the hash you're looking for than it is today. You can get a fairly quick surface level summary by checking out pictures of growers and hash makers production styles 
garden practices, and even the way they treat the earth, as well as other people, by following them on social media. And in my own opinion, the effects of Quality Hash are going to be subjective to the user, as well as where you are and how you're feeling. There are many variables. As for true quality hash that I would want to buy, my preferences are that it has to be grown at the very least organically, in soil and under the sun. I also want it washed by someone who cares about the preservation of the terpenes and resin, the land and the farmers that they work with, as well as the ancient craft of making quality hash. Hey, what can I say? I have high standards in this life. I want to send some love and respect, as well as my wholehearted gratitude to this episode's guests. Reed of Hiker Trash Cannabis Company, Mega Raw Melts, Andy of Great Lakes Grease, Murphy Murray, and Frenchie Cannoli. Thank you all so much for being a part of this episode. I want to encourage all listeners out there to give our guests a follow on their social media platforms. And if the spirit moves you, reach out to them and say thank you as they had your best interests in mind when they were answering this question. I want to take this time to send some love out to everyone in the main cannabis community and the worldwide cannabis community at large. To my longtime friend, the Lone Stiller on Instagram for keeping it real and Need East on Instagram. Happy 30th, D. Got to give a shout out to Chris at the Blazing Ace down in Portland for lacing the studio up with that Puffco Peak. A tip of the cap to this episode's sponsors, All Kind, Frass Valley, and those heroes of us small quality forward farms, the Maine Craft Cannabis Association. Enough respect out to the main beat maker Phonics for being the man and letting us work with his dope beats. Hash Mitten for the remix genius and staying on point. Kush Kitten for all the amazing website help. Everyone who has helped us keep this thing going by donating to the show. And everyone listening right now, thank you. It's my honor and I love being your host. Also, we greatly appreciate the support from everyone who has helped spread the word about this show and episode. We love building episodes like this and want to continue to be able to put out quality information like you just heard. Your support means the world to us. For those who want to show even more support and contribute to the evolution of this podcast, please become a patron of the show. You can click the Donate tab linked to our PayPal and Venmo account on our website, inthetreespodcast.com, or head over to our Patreon account under In The Trees Podcast. Please visit our website, inthetreespodcast.com, for bonus audio and video content, including more stony stories, our well-loved blog, and behind-the-scenes features unaired on the show. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, or download us on Spotify. We want to deliver you more great audio and video content, and your support is greatly appreciated. 